A fő támogatónk jó voltából egy különleges angol nyelvű előadás következik. Felkérem Rozgonyi Zoltánt, a Euroxon vezetőjét, hogy mutassa be az előadót. Köszönöm, hogy jó reggelt! Thank you! Welcome everybody! Um, when we had the first chat about this conference back last year, I believe it was, uh, part of the deal was that we would suggest a, a plenary speaker for the conference. So it was a it was a task for me to go and find somebody whose topic, uh, whose subject, whose talk would be relevant here. So I went to my favorite ever best conference. Every year in February they used to be a methodology conference in Barcelona, organized by IH Barcelona. And when I sat into Teresa Ting's session after five minutes, I just knew I found it. I don't need to go anywhere. So I approached Teresa in the break after her session, invited her, and here she is, Teresa Ting, uh, uh, biologist, neurobiologist, uh, with a PhD in all those sciences, and yet she became a teacher trainer, uh, materials designer for the EFL classroom. Thank you, Teresa, for joining us today, and here you are. Um, I pass it on to you so as we can enjoy your presentation. After the first 40 minute presentation, there will be a workshop with Teresa in the same plenary room. Thank you. Ah, thank you. Thank you very much, Zoltan. And thank you very much, the um, Hungarian Teachers Association, school, um, English Schools Association, for inviting me. I wish we were in Budapest in person. I understand it's a sunny day there. It's also a sunny day here in Calabria. And um, hopefully we'll be able to enjoy the same sun in the same place in the future. <laughs> so thank you very much. So let's uh, start then. Thank you. And uh, like Zoltan said, we're going to have a workshop afterwards. So let me do what I can in this time, in this uh, 40, 45 minutes. Let me share my screen. Now, um, does everybody see this? The panelists? Yes. Okay, great. Here we are. Okay. Uh, now, as you know, the plenary is designing learning with the brain in mind. And um, here I am from the University of Calabria. And that is right here. And there's a little red dot on the boot. And that is where the university is. Now, um, after this um, plenary, there's a workshop and um, it's about materials design. And there are some advantages to holding an online conference. And one of the advantages is that we're gonna have a optional homework for everybody post event. So you can put your theories into practice, you create the tasks and send it in by a due date like our students and you receive feedback, okay, from me with your materials. That's optional if you want, okay. Now, uh, this, this might eliminate some participants because they don't want, but it, it's optional, okay. Now, let's see, let's start with this uh, plenary then. Now, when we start talking about the brain in education, we have to start with caution because a note of caution against neuromythology um, because there are a lot of myths out there about how the brain works or doesn't work. Um, just keep in mind that learning is a very complex process and uh, you should take all presentations about the brain with a big grain of salt, okay? Be critical of what you hear when people tell you about the brain and education. Um, now, so having said that, to be careful, I'm going to tell you about the brain, okay? And the first thing you should ask yourself is, what does she know about the brain? And what does she know about designing learning for the classroom? So here is my uh, favorite slide, um, my favorite starting slide. I have a degree in biology and psychology. And after I finished those degrees, um, I got a degree in neurobiology because I didn't know if I wanted to do the biology part or the psychology part. So I did neurobiology. And I studied memory, neurotoxicity, neuroendocrinology, and I did it in rats and hamsters, in vivo, and in vitro. We took slices of rats' brains and kept them alive and looked at the molecular structure of memory. And I implanted electrodes into br rats' brains, and, and we'll talk about this rat brain um, behavior a little more in detail. Anyway, so this is what I did in my PhD. 
However, as a PhD student, we had to teach MDs, okay, medical doctors, so future doctors. And as I tell people, the PhDs taught the MDs, but the MDs became very rich and we PhDs remain very poor. But anyways, as I was teaching the PhD, uh, the MD students at the medical school, um, I taught human neuroanatomy, which means at the time, that's the time, there were no MRI machines to tell us where the tumor is in the brain. So what we had to do was do dissections of human brains, of course, from cadavers, and um, then look, teach students how to look at clinical symptoms. And from the clinical symptoms of how people speak and how people walk, et cetera, et cetera, we could maybe, hopefully, guess, <laughs> identify where the tumor is, where the lesion is, and then go in to do the operation, okay? That's what we used to teach. Nowadays, with the MRI, you just put them in the MRI and you know, voila, there's the tumor, that's easy. I put my son in the MRI several times just to check that he's okay. So nowadays it's different, but that's how it was then. Then I moved to Italy, here, a little red dot, Calabria. And uh, Italy is a land of fashion, creativity, Ferraris. And so Italian academia is very flexible and creative with human resources. They, so they said, do you know about rats? That's great. Why don't you teach English? So that's when I thought, okay, I'll teach English. And to teach English, of course, you know English, you don't know how to teach it, at least for me. So I went to the UK and got a degree in MA in education for education research. Um, and that's, that helped me start understanding how to research education. So um, people ask me, do you miss neuroscience? Absolutely not, because education is neuroscience. Because these two, this young man and this little rat, are related. Because when we teach, uh, when we learn, we learn with our brain. And education teachers, us, we act on brains, okay? So we are, I am back in neuroscience research, except now I'm studying students and not rats, okay? So when I see this, I think, little electrodes, I think brain slices, and I actually see this. And this is what, the, at the conclusion of this talk, I hope you also see in front of you, not just students, but also some brains, okay, that you can work on for good and bad. So let's start then. Now, um, in 2000, the local um, European Lyceum asked, so they approached me and they said, you know biology, you speak English, so why not come and teach biology in English. And by the way, use CLIL, they asked me. And I thought, well, what's CLIL? So I found out that CLIL means content and language integrated learning, but that didn't help me at all because I still was thinking, what is CLIL? Okay. But I didn't know what CLIL was in 2000, but I did see these students like this in the classroom. And um, I, I had never taught in high school. And this is what I saw. And I thought that was very strange because I know well, from my rat studies, and let me just say quickly, rat, we're not very different from rats. So that's why my reference to rats is very rat relevant, okay? Now, when I study rats, I knew that motivation already exists in the brain. So motivation as a pathway, as a, as a system, exists not as a theory, as a system exists in the brain. That's why we have stuck electrodes in the brain. So why were the students so unmotivated? Okay, that made no sense to me. Let me tell you about these little rats. I would stick electrodes in their little brain in the pathway called the brain reward system, which is related to motivation. Now, when I, when I implant, I'd implant the electrodes and then the rat, the little, the little guys would recover. And then I would put them in a system, in a box, and in this box, um, the rats could, they were connected to a cable and this cable gave them electrical charges in their brain in the pathway related to motivation. And when the rats press a little button, they could self-administer this electrical impulse and start feeling really good all by themselves, okay? Now, when I trained them, all I needed to do was 
when they turned towards the button, I clicked once and they realized, they thought, you could see their little eyes go, boom, what's out there? And they would approach the button. And in, if I implanted the electrode in the right place, it took them two seconds to get to the button and start pressing. And they pressed it so rigorously, they were so motivated to press, 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 press. They didn't want food, they didn't want mating, and didn't, they didn't want water, and they would die just pressing this button. That's how good it felt for the little rats, pressing this little button that gave electrical charges to the part of the brain related to motivation. Okay. Now in humans, we are like rats. This exists in the human brain because when surgeons go in to do neurosurgery to remove tumors, etc., they need to keep the patient alive to make, I mean, alive, <laughs> alive also, but they need to keep the patient awake so that they don't remove too, um, too much tissue, okay? So the patient in brain surgery is awake because there's no pain sensi sensitivity in the brain, okay? So after you put a little numbing on, this, on the scalp, you just saw the bone with a saw, and <laughs> you go into the brain. Now, they would put the equivalent pathway in the human brain about right here, the brain reward system, and they would stimulate the patients while the patients are awake. And they would ask the patients, how do you feel? And the patients feel fantastic. They've never felt better. And they, 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 they would probably, if you gave them a button, they would probably stimulate themselves to death too. But anyways, so the pathway, the brain reward system, motivation is in our brain. It is not a theory. It is not a euphemism. It's there as a structure, okay? It's like saying we can see, yeah, because we have eyeballs, okay? So, yeah, motivation is in the brain. It's called the medial forebrain bundle, okay? Medial forebrain bundle. We're going to talk about this. Now, it's a feeling good state. When you stimulate this, it's a feel-good state. And why does it exist? Because it's evolutionarily useful. Keep this in mind. We're talking about a brain, which is a product of evolution. Everything is related to how is it evolutionarily useful, okay? And it's evolutionarily useful to feel good about certain things, taking care of crying babies, you know, I mean, <laughs> you have to feel good about it, okay? So, motivation already exists in the brain, in the medial forebrain bundle, in the rat, and in the human brain. So voila, we just need to stick some electrodes in our students' brains. That is the solution, okay? But until then, we still can't do that. But until then, we have to find other ways. And that is this, okay? In 2003, I thought, how can CLIL, because I happen to be doing CLIL, there are other ways. CLIL is not the only way, but there, CLIL, I happen to be doing CLIL. How can CLIL harness the system, it's in our brain. It's in the rat's brain, it's in our brain. How can we activate it? That was my question, okay. And so that's when I started researching. In 2003, I started thinking about how can I transform information about the human heart, which these students had to learn, okay. It was part of their school program. Let me take one set of programs and let's do the heart. For 16-year-olds, I started designing materials for 16-year-old students to do about the human heart. And in 2013, I received the Elton's Award for the set of materials, okay? So I use a set of materials to, as an example of how um, we can harness the motivation system, which is already in the brain. Now, of course, I didn't just do this for 10 years, but yeah, it takes time to develop good materials. But anyways, so this is what um, I'm going to show you today, okay? So I'm going to do some brain-compatible CLIL. I'm going to have you be schizophrenic. You're going to be 16-year-old students, and then you're going to be 26-year-old teachers to analyze how it worked. But I want you to experience the learning, okay? Then I'll analyze the experience with you. So first, you're going to be 16-year-old students, but good students, huh? not those that just talk nonstop. Okay. And if you have already cleared these materials with me, of course, observe what happened. This is something, unfortunately, to do with, with, with other people. If you have already done this, just reflect on how you could transform these tasks into your own 
a subject that you're interested in. Okay, now let's start. Now, listen carefully. All participants will have access to the PDF of all these tasks. So just relax and participate, please. Okay, if you're, um, if you're, of course, we're all at home sitting in front of, please grab a piece of paper and be ready to write on your piece of paper. Everybody, 10 seconds, grab a piece of paper and a pen and be ready to write, please. Okay, Zoltan, okay, I see that the panelists have it. Very good, because if you don't participate, you're not gonna get the most out of this, okay? Now, so the materials originally look like this, but of course I adapted them for this workshop, okay, online. So I assume you have a piece of paper and a pen, and there are 50 or so panelists, you can type in the chat space, but when I ask you to send something, I want you to send only when I tell you to send, okay? So um, don't send until I say send, okay? Now, and other times I don't want you to do anything in the chat space, okay? So I'll, I'll give you instructions. Now, so I'm gonna show you then, okay? this first task. Here it is. Exercise 1a. Decide which words we must use to correctly formulate five questions about the heart. Only write your choice on a piece of paper. For example, number one, how many or how much chambers does a heart have? So all you have to choose, do is choose between how many and how much. Okay, just write. So you write everyone, everyone. Just write on your piece of paper how many or how much, which one is correct to complete this? Okay, which one is correct? And the panelists, please type in the chat space. Let me try and see if I can see your chat space. Please type in the chat space. Um, yeah, okay, please type in the chat space. And when I say send, you send it, okay? And now, let's see. You know what? I think if if you're in the if I'm sharing, I don't think I can see the chat space. Uh, oh no, here it is. I see it. Sorry, let me find. There we are. Okay. Now, okay, ready, panelists? Send in your answers, please. Okay, send it in. Okay, and everybody else, you should be sending it in also. I'm not sending it in, you should be we're waiting for the panelists. So of course, here you have how many, okay? How many chambers? I'm not asking you to answer the question. I'm just asking you to decide grammatically which one is correct, okay? So how many, okay? Very good. Now let's move on. Now I want you to do these, two, three, four, and five. Very quickly, everybody. Don't write in the chat space, panelists. Don't worry about writing in the chat space. Number two, look at this, choosing how many, how much. Number three, okay. I'm gonna give you a few seconds to do that. I'm gonna play some music in the meantime. Oh no, you can't hear my music here. We're in the wrong microphone setting. Just very quickly then. Can you hear that? Okay. <laughs> okay, let's see what you have here. Okay, let's check them together. So, number one was how many? chambers does a heart have? Number two would be how much blood, okay? Number three, what are the other upper chambers called? Number four, how are the ventricles, the lower chambers, different from, okay, different from the upper chambers? And number five would be, is it true? 
Okay. Now there are language reasons behind these choices. Okay, of why I chose to have students choose these, but we won't, we won't talk about it right now. Okay, so let's see then. So students would be choosing this. Okay, then let's see what they have to do next. Here are the here are the correct questions. Exercise one B would be decide which seven possible answers from A to G correctly answers these five questions. Okay, so I'm going to leave this up now, and I want you all to work on this for a few seconds, and I'm going to play some music. So do a match, number one, A, B, C, D, or E, F, G, okay, just write quickly on your piece of paper. Now, of course, in, in the past, there were pieces of paper and we would have students work on it like this. Now here, um, we've set it up like this too. So let's check ourselves, okay? Let's check to see how we did. So let's see here. So how many chambers does the heart have? There are four, okay? You cannot go wrong, okay? There's no other choice that would answer this. How much blood does the heart pump each minute? F. Okay, number two would be go, would go with F. Okay, number five, just to change it. Is it true? I hope you chose A, 5A. Yes, it is, okay? Number three, what are the upper chambers called? I hope you chose C, okay, three with C. Atria plural, atrium singular. And number four, how are the ventricles, the lower chambers, different from the upper chambers? Now, um, so I hope you chose, whoops, I hope you chose, they are larger, E. Okay, now there is no way you can get it wrong, <laughs> okay? There is no way you can get it wrong. Very quickly, what we're going to be doing the workshop is what is this this is using short answers to get answers okay we're using short answers to get answers there's a there's a lot more interesting work that you can do with short answers okay now anyways moving on exercise two this is important i'd like you to read it carefully and do this task here's the task Dino Sauro and Einstein are in the same class. They both study very hard, but Ein always gets better grades because he knows that it is important to use language academically. Dino continues to believe that the only thing that matters is the if the information is correct. I'd like you to look at the two texts and decide which one was written by Dino and which one was written by Ein. Okay, I'm going to give you um, 40 seconds to do this and
so. So let's see. I assume you guessed that. Uh, guessed. I assume you deduced that this was written by Dino, and this was written by Ein. Okay. Oops. So now, so I was going to ask you this, but anyway. So this is Dino, and this is Ein. Now, now use this information. You're still in the student stage. Huh? You're still 16. So now use this information you just did work with and look at this exercise, exercise three. Using the information you have obtained in exercise one and two, decide which schematic diagram represents the heart. Okay, think carefully what you did. Okay, now, so I hope you chose, I hope you chose A. Okay, voila, okay, you did it. You're as good as the students. Okay, now let's go on. Did it work? Let me show you if it worked. Here are some what students did, okay? They have done five out of 24 activities after 15 minutes. This is 15 minutes. What they show, what I show here are blue are sh showing mistakes, Ventri two ventricle, no S, symmetry, double M it should be, okay, situated, which without an H, etc. This is the same mistake twice, same mistake twice, so double lines, dotted lines, I mean. This is, oh, terrible. However, this is all correct, totally correct from the point of view of content, from the point of view of language, totally correct. I want you to notice also that they self-corrected. Why? And the A. In it, Italian learners of English often say then instead of than. I don't know about Hungarian students, but this is a typical mistake. Why? Why doesn't it exist in Italian? They sell, she, the student, I don't know who these students are because I just go into the schools and do these experiments on them. But anyways, so this why doesn't exist. In addition, look at this, left hyphen right symmetry. This hyphenation, compound adjective hyphenation doesn't exist in Italian. Two atria, right atrium, you saw. Atrium singular, atria plural. Okay, 15 minutes huh, of this clear thing. Um, interventricular septum. Okay, now they got left right symmetry, but they, they, they created left right chambers. So this is creation of language. Okay, now this shows ability to use discipline appropriate academic language to communicate age appropriate complex knowledge. Okay, so this stu these students, after 15 minutes, age-appropriate productive academic literacy in the foreign language. Okay, this is, this is what's interesting. So the question we had was, the medial forebrain bundle exists in the brain. Can we use CLIL to activate this bundle? The answer is, yes, we can. And even today, thank goodness, yes, we can is still with us. Okay, so at this point, this is what we can say. Yes, we can. Now, how was it possible? Let's look at it from the brain point of view. Let's look at how it was designed. How was this possible to use these stupid activities that you were able to do in this workshop? It took you what, a few, few minutes. How was it possible for students after 15 minutes of this kind of stuff to produce this kind of text? Let's see. First of all, the first point is you are alive, ergo, your brain is always on. If you're sitting here today, your brain is on, okay? So even you were able to get to the right answer because you're sitting here today and you're alive. Even if you don't think your brain is on, it's on, okay? Likewise for our students. Now, to prove that point, 
read this text. Okay. Now, I'm sure you've seen this text before. What does this show you? This shows us something very important about the brain. The brain processes information immediately looking for meaning. Always. Always. If you are breathing, your brain tries to make sense of whatever information is going in, whether you like it or not, and whether you know or not. Okay. It's always on. Now, one could say, no way. We are smart animals and can control our thinking. We are too smart to waste our brain power processing useless information. Only fools think too quickly. Or we can say, thank goodness, all animals think fast and we are just like other little animals. Okay, even if thinking fast may result in incorrect assumptions, it's better to make sense of nonsense. Okay. The truth is, B. We are just like other little animals. We are not as smart as we think we are. Now, oops, I have a computer issue. Oh no. Let me see if I can stop sharing. And then share again. That would help. Uh, it's not helping. And I'm not being, I'm not able to process. Um, I have a problem here with my PowerPoint. Um, restart, hmm. restart it and let's see. Let me see. Uh, I think I have to get out of this and start it again. Okay. Here's the PowerPoint. Okay, and now I can see you though. Um, let me see, where was I? Okay. Just as we were talking about how the brain works. Okay, let's see, where were we? Um, here we are. Okay, now I'm going to go here. No, I'm going to first go to share screen. I'm going to share my whole screen now, so I won't be able to see the panelists. Um, we are still here. Actually, so. if I do this, would that is that ugly for you guys? Is that terribly awful? We, we can see it, so it's... Is that okay? Can you see that? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, okay. There we are. So, the question was, are we like other little animals and think too quickly? Or are we so smart we can control our thinking? We cannot control our thinking. So, why? Because when we were once upon a time in the jungle, in the savanna, if we saw something back there behind the bush that was this orange color that was moving around, we needed to run right away. We had to think quickly. We had no time to sit and wonder, is that a baby cub? Is that a big tiger? Is that a small tiger? We just had to run. It's better to run, and then it was just a dry bush, than to not run at all. So that's why our brain is wired this way. We are wired to respond quickly and to make sense of information. So processing information is essential in the jungle. Our brain is a product of evolution. It's always on and processing information, even if it's useless. And even if it's not understanding most of the information, it may waste brain power, but it's essential for survival. Okay. So that's why all this, you were able to understand it, but I had it set up like this because it was controlled. I controlled where your brain was moving. Okay. By going step by step by step. I wasn't leaving you free to think. <laughs> I was controlling your thinking and using language to help you think in the direction I wanted you to think. And besides, another, pro another, another thing about the brain. These were stupid, simple, solvable problems. Okay? 
A problem solving state activates this thing called the reticular activating system of our brain which is attention behavior and it dilates our pupils. When we're paying attention, our pupils dilated. And this is your friend, let me see how you pronounce this, Csikszentmihalyi. <laughs> Csikszentmihalyi is a Hungarian psychologist and he is about flow of consciousness. He studied artists and he noticed that artists could stay in the state of flow for days without eating. Okay, because they were in flow. Because, and they were in modern day, one enters an, op an optimal state of flow. And I'll leave this. You can watch, look at this slide later. It's a delicate zone between boredom and anxiety. So when students are in flow, even with their masks on here, when they're in flow, they're, they're absorbing information. And when you are solving those stupid problems about the heart, you are in flow. Okay, you were in flow, and whether you liked it or not, your brain was taking in information. When you're in flow, you can take this, okay, this is optimal state, high interest, it says, high interest, maximum state of flow. Is this high interest? Not really, come on, let's admit it. This is about the human heart, it's not really high interest. However, how did you get into this? Not because I counted on your interest, because I gave you a stupid solvable problem and we just can't resist a good challenge, a good problem to solve. How many, how much? Oh, that's easy. I can do that. And how many, how much blood? I can do that. So you start getting into it, whether you like it or not. So for, that's the same idea as crossword puzzles and Sudoku. We spend our time, waste our time doing these things because it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to solve solvable problems. And when we solve simple solvable problems, what happens is our pupils are dilated because we're paying attention, we're in flow, thanks to cheeks at Mihai. And norepinephrine is all over the brain. And what happens is we find solutions, we have the aha moment. And when we have the aha moment, after we've solved the, quest, solved the problem, our pupils constrict. However, if we present our students with problems that they perceive as unsolvable, their pupils constrict to start with. They don't even bother dilating their pupils. Okay, so this is a physiological response. We can't control this. We cannot control this. So here we are. We have the medial forebrain bundle, the brain reward system, attention and interest and motivation to do something. The question was, can we stimulate it? Yeah, we can. Okay, we can with the right input. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is that, okay, so that is an example of how we use simple English grammar, reviewing short answers, and we've set up complex language. Look at this complex language that is produced in 15 minutes. Now, why does Zwart need to learn English? Because he has big dreams. He doesn't know he doesn't need to know English, but at this age, he thinks he needs to learn English because he wants a big job, which calls for big English. Okay, big English does not mean my name is Zwart. I like soccer. I like acting. I like it. That is not big English. That is not going to get him a job. He needs this kind of English to get a job. I know it's very instrumentalist, but that's the truth, okay? So taking that instrumentalist approach, this is, um, I would like you to take a note of this. This is a project that we're producing. We're putting together materials for, oh, we're putting together materials for this, um, for teaching academic English, okay? And um, so this is Adibe, Attention to Diversity in Bilingual Education. I'm gonna be very quick now. Now these are traditional EFL experts. Um, um, Ellis, Bygate, um, and company. And the task-based language teaching uh, work in conference in 2015, they said to communicate big ideas, Zwart must have master authentic complex language. So what do they propose in traditional EFL education? They propose increasing task complexity. Complex task is complex thinking produces complex language. That's the idea. 
okay, in traditional EFL education. So they take, they take Dutch speakers, this is their experiment, and they go to the pharmacist and ask for an expensive painkiller, please. That is their task complexity. So they go along the language continuum and hopefully reach complex language. Well, thought number one, is this complex enough? And thought number two, what, what is, is there a production of complex, is there a production of complex outputs? And then how sustainable is this complexity? I mean, how many times can you go to the pharmacist and bug them about this in, inexpensive painkiller, please? It's not very sustainable. So, CLIL provides language teachers the complexity we need to develop learners' ability to receive complex language and produce it so they can language about complex ideas. So this is, that's what the workshop is going to be. I'm concluding now. The workshop will be there for harnessing content for attention, flow, and language development. I'm going to show you that. I'm going to show you how to do it in young children. And to show young children talking about using grammar, which is beyond their age, according to the traditional EFL curriculum. And we're going to look at how this process is nested in Cummins quadrant of language tasks. And I think I'm done. Concluding here, this, this deserves some good reading. The brain of a child, or anybody actually, is a superbly efficient and instinctive learning device. So much a part of any normal living creature that it functions automatically, even like little animals. The task of education is not to create or even develop the ability to learn or create motivation but to understand and res respect its nature and thereby facilitating its operation. Frank Smith. Now, CLIL is one way. And so I hope that at the end of um, this, you may have some idea of how the brain works, a little bit about how the brain works, and therefore happy educating to those brains. And if you come to the workshop, We'll continue a little bit about this and look at some materials, clear materials that you can then simulate and uh, work on as homework if you want. Okay, I'm done here then. Thank you very much for your attention and I'll turn this off. Thank you very much.